Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry about the delay. Uh, we had some uh, technical difficulties, but uh, that's what happens when you go live. <laughs> um, and uh, here are we today again with uh, uh, Sebastian Dashner, and he will be talking about uh, if you can read what's on the screen, best practices for modern Java uh, enterprise Java projects. So, um, without further um, uh, ado, let's just uh, turn it over to Sebastian. Welcome, Sebastian. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot as well. Um, and that's now was a very quick and hectic start because if you prepare a lot of um, technology behind, you know, video equipment and audio equipment, and then of course in the last minute it doesn't work. So uh, now I'm glad it's working and you can read this here. So yeah, hi and welcome to this Jakarta EE Tech Talk uh, on best practices for uh, enterprise Java projects, especially for modern projects, um, it's always hard to see what are the current best practices out there just because um, Jakarta or Java EE or J2EE has been out there for such a long time. And I go into a lot of enterprise projects and I see, you know, a lot of things that could be somewhat improved. And this was the motivation to give this talk to share a few best practices uh, with you, mostly around how we build projects, how we can um, basically make the build more efficient and how we can, well, make sure that we save a lot of time when uh, when we build our projects. So we can develop it more, with more efficiency and with more joy, ultimately. So my name is Sebastian, born and raised in Munich, Germany, and I work for this company called IBM, and I do a lot of things on enterprise Java. This is um, my background that I've been in uh, for many, many years, so I do... Um, Java E, Jakarta E, Microprofile, Enterprise Java in general, and then a lot of things that just enterprise projects would need. And I'm not a big fan of slides, so I think code is more interesting, and I want to share a lot of code and do live coding here uh, for uh, this hour. So what I will show you now is a very, um, just from the beginning, what are some best practices how to build projects? And another fun fact about me, I like coffee. So I will show some coffee shop example application that we're going to build in a modern way with some best practices in mind. And I will show, well, a lot of tips and tricks how to basically be a little bit more productive and how we can solve uh, all of these issues in a, in a modern world. So first thing I want to show you, this is um, a Maven Palm XML of a project. You see the project is called Coffee Shop. And now, one of uh, the few things that I really, really care about when we, how we build our project is how we start building our Maven um, or Java artifacts um, when we build our project, right? So this is built by Maven. You can do very similar things via Gradle um, if you want, but a few things are uh, important in my eyes. So first of all, if you see the list of dependencies, then you only see two dependencies. That is the Jakarta API and the MicroProfile API. How this works together, well, I, um, I will show in a second. But the most important thing for now is that both API, um, APIs or both dependencies are provided. That means they will not end up in our deployment artifact. And then what else you can see here is a lot of, lot of, lot of test dependencies that are all um, included with the test scope. So that is important. I will talk about testing a little bit later and then pretty much that's it. So what else we can see um, is some Maven plugins and the only reason why I define this is basically because, well, I'm brave enough to use a new recent Java version, actually not the latest version, um, not 13, but Java 12. And then Maven still has to update, the, uh, update their plugins. So if you run the test plugins and the war plugin, it will sometimes fail or issue some warnings. So you manually have to update the version here. Um, unfortunately, that is not uh, covered yet by the Maven Super Pump. So you have to refine just these versions. Other than that, that's pretty much it what I want to have in my project. So not more um, you know, com complicated XML. Life is too short to do XML, right? So that is pretty much what we want to include here. And then how I built this project, well, first of all, is, you know, I use Maven on the command line, so I can do things like, you know, Maven clean install, for example, or even simpler, Maven clean package, or only Maven clean, Maven package without a clean face, if you want. I typically issue this build, and then what it will do, it will just build a project. So 
probably because of this streaming stuff going on, this is a little bit slow. Let's do this again. Uh, four seconds, it should be a little bit less, like maybe two seconds, depending on, uh, well, doesn't get faster, how fast your laptop is. But um, that's pretty much it. So one of the few things um, that we want to care about is that our project builds fast. And this is thanks to the fact that we don't include um, a lot of plugins or uh, lifecycle things into Maven. If I build the project, it uh, should build quickly. When it comes to testing, we we uh, gonna ba go back for that in a second. And now the question is, if I built this here, then I have a thin WAR file, a thin deployment artifact, and now I have to deploy this somehow, right? So there are many, many ways how to do that. We have to get some um, runtime that supports uh, Jakarta and my co-profile um, here. What I will do, what I will include is I use Open Liberty to um, run this project. You could use any sort of, of your choice and I run this locally um, and also in production using Docker, using Docker containers. So here is my Docker file and that is already an interesting thing for um, a best practice, I want the Docker file also to be simple and easy. Now, you might ask yourself, okay, there are some other um, technologies out there um, where I'm not required to write a Docker file in order to build a Docker image. Um, there are some other Maven plugins um, out there, for example, but the reason why I typically just write a simple Docker file is, well, if you're in plain EE, this is you know really easy three lines of code, not more, and it won't get much uh, more complex than that because I include a base image that already includes my runtime and um, a JDK or JRE, in my case, uh, Java 12 here with Open Liberty. Then I might add some optional server configuration and of course my thin deployment artifact. That's it. That's all that it's um, included here. And the reason why I built this um, via Docker is just, you know, Firing that up on the command line is a very, very simple way. So I can say something like coffee shop temp and it builds it and, um, oh yes, I still have to um, write the server XML. It's a good point. Um, it's another thing that I wanted to show you from scratch. Um, so I don't want to include too much um, out of the box for you so I can code this just live. Uh, what I need in order to run this with Liberty is the server XML configuration. And that is basically just telling the runtime which features to include. Now, that is a little bit of an optimization thing, if you want, because we could just go and say, our runtime supports the Jakarta API and MicroProfile. And I could just like, you know, include these two. So for example, I can say a server that is called feature manager feature. So for example, this, um, still called Java E um, here, Java 8, and then micro profile. Um, or I'd say, and this is now a little bit of an optimization, if I know that my runtime, that my project for now only includes, for example, JaxRS and maybe, you know, JSON B and maybe CDI, then I can just write these individually and just specifying the features that I want. It's a little bit of question what whether you care about it. The benefit you get is that this then starts up a little bit faster because the OSGI modules don't have uh, have to load everything that's included in Jakarta and MicroProfile, but only what you need. But that's a little bit of a question of a taste. And then you can build this. And now again, the reason why I built this on the command line just by issuing Docker build and nothing else is, you know, it builds very quickly and it's very easy. I just need a Docker file and then these Docker commands. So that is one takeaway. I don't want to overuse the tool usage here, mostly regarding Maven. This is what I see a lot in projects. You know, you have Palm XMLs with a few thousand lines of code and then some plugins that build your Docker images and things like that. And ultimately, from my experience, you spend more time actually configuring these things here in the Palm XML to get just the right image that you want if you could just you know, write three lines of code here and then fire up Docker build, push the Im image if you wanna build it locally and that's it. So for me, that's actually the easiest way and also the fastest way to build a Docker image, right? I mean, if, uh, if I again um, call Maven package, if I want, if I want to rebuild that WAR file and then I just issue uh, the Docker build again and then I'm done, right? You don't get much, much faster than this. So I think uh, this makes sense. Now let's finally order some coffee. Let's finally run this example here. So what I have is my example application. 
which I want to show you via HTTP and REST. So if you're familiar with EE APIs, this is JAX REST. If you're familiar with the Spring world, this is very much like Spring REST controllers. So we have something like an HTTP resource um, that will be available via the URL slash orders. And then um, represented in a JSON format, we can have some, you know, coffee orders. We can get some orders, we can post some orders to order some coffee and so on and so forth. And then we can basically run this example. Now I could run this just by running this Docker image by running a container from the Docker image. So for example, um, if I run this via Docker run and say, I think I called it coffee shop temp, then I could just fire this up and then this starts my runtime, right? Super easy. But also what I want to show you, let me show you uh, this quickly, is that we have a few more optimized approaches to do this. And as another best practice, what I want to show you is basically how to be a little bit more efficient with your um, runtime, um, curl localhost. If, for example, now I go to my coffee shop project, I can check out the orders, right? So once that is deployed, I see, okay, what are my coffee orders in the system? So this is an empty JSON array because, well, there is no order yet. So if we would um, create some order by posting a JSON, um, here with, well, what do we need? So already, if you're familiar with the APIs, you see, okay, this includes bean validation into JAXRS. You know, this is just a nice story of um, Java E or Jakarta E that you can have these specs being interoperable. So you can just mix and match these specifications. And now for our example, we need to include a coffee type, you know, like a drink type. So for example, we want to uh, post some espresso here. So then we create this espresso order, and then hopefully, yes, the order is in the system. This looks good. Okay, anyway, now we created some, some order here that is a very basic Hello World example using JAXRS, CDI, um, and JSON B. But, well, now a little bit more about the development um, uh, workflow here, right? Because what happens if we would like to change something here, then, well, we would need to rebuild and especially we would need to restart the runtime. And even if we have a runtime that starts up very, very quickly, and that is actually another good news. And uh, despite the, uh, well, common knowledge out there, modern Jakarta or EE runtimes are very, very fast. Um, thanks to techniques such as OSGI and um, modern approaches, um, how to build up a modular runtime, you have servers that start up, you know, in, in seconds, you don't have to wait half an hour anymore. Uh, for heavyweight runtime. So this is uh, very good news, but still it's a little bit too slow if we always, you know, just change some code and would like to test it out because then we would need to rebuild our project and then just uh, restart the container or however we run it, right? So another approach, what I want to show you, and this is just for the example for Open Liberty, is you might want to build up approach where you can minimize that turnaround time. And what I want to show you is a, um, may even plug in that adds basically the support for um, a development mode for Liberty. Now, what I said before is don't overuse the Maven um, usage. So what is this plugin doing here, right? But in this case, I say, okay, just for the development uh, workflow, it has a benefit, this plugin. And luckily it doesn't slow down my build because in the normal phase Maven package, this is not executed. This doesn't do anything, um, which is good. So in my case, what I can do, let's stop the Docker um, container again. If I say I include now Maven package um, Liberty dev, which is a development mode for Open Liberty, then this will start up Open Liberty in a development mode where it just will watch for my file changes and then do a very uh, quick hot reload. So there are, uh, there are a few technologies out there that support this now. And whatever technologies or runtime you choose, I think it's just important to have such a fast um, feedback loop of basically including um, new stuff, changing code, um, changing some configuration, and then just having um, these changes being reflected automatically on the fly. So what I want to show you now is I want to um, code a little bit more. And especially I want to show you the combination of Jakarta and MicroProfile, because I think in modern EE, that is another best practice to just mix and match uh, from these standards and then include things like, you know, MicroProfile Health or MicroProfile Config, because 
um, the, the background uh, from these technologies is very similar. So both are based on enterprise Java and the programming model is very nice and very familiar, right? So we also have a um, declarative approach of doing things. And what I will show you now, so you see this still works, then order some coffee again, and then the orders in the system. What I want to do you now, uh, show you now is basically enhancing my project with some, some more stuff. So for example, I have my code profile here, the API, so I can use you know, the API in my code. Besides that, what I can also do, I can add features on the fly. So I can, for example, say, please add MicroProfile Health 2.0, and it will hot reload just this example, and then you know install that feature on my runtime while I'm coding, while this is running. So you saw there's something happening here, and then just very quickly, the application is being restarted. And now, apparently, I also can access this um, resource that you might know if you have uh, checked out micro profile slash health, which is a default resource that just says, okay, it's, you know, up. That is the default resource with HTTP 200. Okay. Well, that's not quite enough. I actually want to see whether my application is up and running. So for example, I call this uh, health. And then uh, what I do, uh, it implements a health uh, check from micro profile. That's the way how to um, write this. And then I implement just this call that could check for, you know, whatever um, I would like to have here. Um, named, I call this coffee shop. It's up and built this. So it will include a default check um, for this for this example. I define this as readiness probe and application scope CDI bean. And now the interesting news is just this will be um, updated on the fly very, very quickly. And I see now this check being up there. And whatever technology you use, right? So this is Liberty with micro profile health check, but whatever. The point is, as a developer, you want to be sure that your turnaround cycle is very, very short, that immediately you see some update, right? So I can uh, code some, uh, some more stuff here. I say, okay, for example, include some data, say, you know, hello world whatever you want to do, and then just uh, very quickly update that. And then you have it right here. So for me, I have like, when I'm programming, I have a rule, like how fast my technology or whatever I'm doing reacts. And I call this the coffee rule. So for example, if I change something here, you know, from hello world to goodbye world, and then if I do some action or I wait for something, I want to take, you know, my cup of coffee, I take a sip, I place it back down and then it needs to be finished, right? If it takes longer than that, it's too slow. So if, you know, you build your project, if you fire up your test suite, if you do whatever, if you wait for the reload, it needs to be faster than that, ideally uh, immediately, right? So I think that is crucial in order to, you know, just stay productive because what happens, we are humans and we just get easily distracted, right? So even if we have to wait just more than five seconds even, we get distracted, right? So I have to wait, I have to wait. And then what happens? I check Slack, I check social media, I take my smartphone, right? And then you're out of the flow experience. So you just want to stay in the flow and make sure that is being updated quickly, right? Or whatever you do, you get a fast feedback. Now, let me show another thing, uh, MicroProfile config. Let's do this, uh, 1.3. So MicroProfile config is just another um, micro profile um, technology where I can have some injectable configuration. So if you're into um, EE and CDI, you might say, well, you can do the same with uh, CDI producers. Yeah, that's totally true. But you can also just use this technology and then save uh, this class and few lines of code by just using um, this um, qualifier at config property, where I can just add, um, inject, for example, the version of your application. And then say, instead of this, I just want to emit uh, the version here. And then my application version will be, what's the case once that is updated, hello, yes. Need to be waited for the autosave from the IDE. And then you see, now I include the application version, which is one, two, three. Okay, now you might ask yourself, where does this version come from? Well, the, the few um, default, um, config sources in MicroProfile config 
So for example, property files um, is one. There is a default convention location, microprofile-config.properties, where I can just include that. And then, you know, that is being configured. Another one is environment variables, where you could actually overwrite this. So this is very helpful for containerized environments, right? And another good news of this update plugin approach is if you update the properties file, what I just did from one to three to one to four, then this change will also be immediately reflected because again, this is a convention path. So the profile knows about this path and you know, this is just being updated. So whatever you update um, here in your code, whether it's Java code, whether it's configuration, whether it's um, a POM XML dependency or a runtime feature, all of that I want to see reflected immediately, right? So let's do a little bit of uh, more of live code with this config because this is just a static configuration where I say, okay, this string here is always the same with um, declarative lookup, but I can also do a programmatic lookup by in injecting this config. And in order to do that, let me implement another feature. Let's say the coffee orders here, as you can see, also have a price, a price attached to it. By the way, in real world, never do um, money calculations with floating, floating point numbers, right? Only an example, don't do this at home. But I want to add some pricing information here as well. And of course, I don't want the user to set the price, but this um, should be configured well, depending on the drink type, right? Like, you know, an espresso is a little bit cheaper than a latte and things like that. So let's say this is another feature this is another business logic that i want to include here so in order to do this let's say i want to um, add some price let's say some price calculator let's write this and then in my coffee shop i will of course want to inject the price calculator here right and then, well, I want to calculate some price. So for example, I want to say, well, in order to set the price, I want to calculate the price here. Um, for example, where is method? No. For example, I'll calculate price for a coffee order. And then this is not void, but double for a given, for example, coffee order. And then say, okay, now, um, for this order, it depends on the price, how expensive it is, right? So order, um, sorry, it depends on the type, how expensive it is. And then say, do something like um, get configured price, right? So look up the, oops, look up the configured price for this coffee order. And now how do we look, uh, look that up? Well, basically we can um, go to the config provider and manually look up this config of my microprofile config here and then say, okay, now programmatically, please get this value of, well, let's have a look here, of the coffee prices. So coffee prices dot something. So let's do this, coffee prices dot, and then, well, whatever is being sent here. So type name and also to lowercase. Well, it's not really readable. Let's outsource this into a variable. And now we want to have this as a double type, right? So that should be injected or looked up as a double. And then this hopefully will be configured here, right? So by the way, I can just keep um, keep coding here what I just did. And then, you know, it will recompile and recompile and maybe fail because of uh, compilation errors and things like that. But it doesn't matter. I can just continue doing this. And once the compilation will be successful and, um, again, and then I say, okay, now this should work. And then I can calculate the price uh, by using this injected price calculator. And then hopefully we can, well, try this out again. So let's try this out. I will um, post another coffee. I will order another espresso. And now I want to see that actually my coffee here, let's use this um, URL, that my coffee now has a price attached to it. Yes, this looks good. So whether you think that's cheap or not depends, I guess, where you, where you live. Um, let's uh, assume that is in euros. And now for the espresso, it was so and so much, so and so expensive, right? Let's try this out again with another drink. Let's say this is a latte. So now in this case, I want to check whether this price is being reflected correctly as well. And yes, uh, three euros here. So this works. So depending on the type, we can have a programmatic lookup here for a micro profile as well. So as you just see, this is a very nice. Um, 
development workflow by just keeping you know in this flow mode by just changing something seeing the changes being reflected and so on and so forth so for me that is another best practice to just keep these turnarounds cycles short and well it's not just about testing something manually what i just did you know i ordered some new coffee and i checked it no the same is true actually for your proper tests that you run so let's talk a little bit about testing here i have some tests being included here and this is just very very basic for example i include some um, basic unit tests that uses junit 5 parameterized tests so as you saw in my project this is just the well, I would say test technology that's used in most of the projects that I see, JUnit, nowadays JUnit 5 with um, Mokito and ideally assert J. I like the um, assertion, um, um, the um, readable APIs of assert J here. And we can just, you know, write, write very basic tests. So the topic of testing is a more bigger one and a complex one in general. What I really, really care is that the whole test suite runs just very quickly. And I mean, instantly. So if you have a more complex project, then you know you might have hundreds of test classes and they need to run with less than a second. If you have plain JUnit with the JUnit runner, you can literally run hundreds of tests in a few milliseconds. JUnit is very performant and very fast uh, if you do this in a code level. And in general, I just want my test suite to run quickly. Now for code level tests, you can achieve that. Um, the most important thing is that you, as much as possible, avoid um, test runners that, you know, try to start up the whole world. So, for example, if you, uh, if you start embedded containers, things like if you're in the spring world, spring context test, things like Achillean, things like CDI unit. Uh, so there's a reason why I'm not um, a big fan of these technologies. Um, the, um, the TLDR for that is, well, it typically adds a lot to your test um, runtime. So they typically um, run slowly. You don't see this impact immediately. You see it only in more complex projects once you have many, many of these tests. And this is how you end up with build times you know, in minutes and more. And um, ultimately, if we are in a modern you know, microservice world with distributed systems where we have a lot of uh, communication between systems going on, then it's actually more and more important that you end that you test the end-to-end -end, um, integration example of how you um, how your services interact with each other, of whether this communication works as expected, right? And for that, it's not enough to just have simulated um, tests that fire up some simulated environment, but to run the test against the actual running environment or the same environment that would later on run in production. So, for example, if you run your application in Docker containers it's crucial that you know you test the same uh, the docker containers from the same docker images uh, that you test for example locally or that you test in your ci cd pipeline and so on and so forth in order to reflect you know the correct um, examples here so in order to do that um, let me show another test that i have i call this um, it for integration test so that is coffee shop it that's another maven best practice if we call our tests something test, T-E-S-T, -E that will be executed by Maven Surefire out of the box. And if we call it IT for integration test, then it won't be executed for Maven Surefire. It will not be included in Maven package or um, one of these phases, but only if you explicitly um, run the ITs. So if you configure something in your Palm XML where you manually exclude some patterns, that's actually not necessary. You can just use the convention and that will work as expected as well. So what I have here with, the, um, with this IT, I basically want to test, you know, this is a very basic smoke test, whether my application is up and running. So that should be a test with a more end-to-end -end scope where I connect against my actual running application and just, you know, test this out. I could connect to it and then, you know, create some coffee orders and connect to it again and verify whether the order is in the system correctly and all these things. If you're interested in that, I can point you to some more uh, resources um, that are produced on the topic of testing. But just in general, the point here is you want fast feedback on also that end-to-end -end test level, right? So if you change some code, you want to be sure that also, you know, the proper um, the proper uh, production code that, for example, emits your HTTP resources and your JSON works as expected. So in other words, you quickly want to fire up these end-to-end -end system tests, integration tests, 
against your locally running environment to just quickly verify that. And with the approach that I showed you, this is actually possible. So for example, if I say, well, I have this application and another nice feature of this plugin here is if you hit enter, then it will just run your tests. And first of all, it will run the Surefire unit tests. So it runs this test, which runs very quickly. And then it will also fire up the ITs, the integration test. So my typical Maven build doesn't do this, but now I see, okay, Assertion failed. Why? Because, well, I, ref um, I reconfigured this before. So I say, check that the system is up. So this means, well, check the health check resource of MicroProfile Health and see whether that's up and running. And then also get the application version that I included and check whether it's equal to one, two, three. Well, you noticed we didn't um, uh, do this here. We changed it to one, two, four. So now let me actually change it and run the tests again. And now everything is green. So what this test does, it's basically a very simple HTTP client that connects to my locally running application and says localhost 9080, please connect in this case to health, check for is system up, whether the system is actually up and running or here get the application version that is included in my um, health check response, just for me, right? I could um, change this uh, system driver here to say, please create a coffee order and then it will post you know, this and that to this URL. Now get the order for the following ID and so on and so forth. So again, by doing this approach, I can just run this test very, very quickly because it's plain that it's a unit still. I don't fire up anything um, that is running here, but I can just connect to something that is already up and running. I can, of course, run the same test in my IDE, whatever you prefer here, or I can even run it from command line. In either way, it's just very fast and very you know, uh, productive. So for example, if I would like to run this on the command line, I say Maven fail safe integration test. So this is the way how to manually and explicitly run the ITs and not the show file tests actually. So you will see, hey, this runs the integration test and now this runs the same thing, connects to localhost and checks my application that is running locally. So again, I want this quick verification. So let's try this again. If I say, for example, I have my property file, I want to change, let's change this back here. I want to change this in this regard. And then um, what I do, I can um, run these tests again, and then this needs to fail, right? And then I can again check either my test or change my test or change the um, application properties, whatever you want to have, and then just quickly have this verification. So again, instant verification. That is important in order to stay uh, in the development flow. Uh, for the tests, what else is important to achieve that? And typically, I care a lot about this is that you separate the test life cycles from the test environment life cycle. Why? I think this is the easiest way to manage. So I know there are a lot of fans out there for, uh, for um, complicated test frameworks where I can fire up a lot of stuff using Java APIs. And while this might be handy on the Java side in order to create, for example, Docker containers and fire them up in my test, the issue I always have, if you annotate some, you know, um, um, JUnit 5 extension or some test runner for JUnit uh, 4, then you always make the life cycle more complicated and you bundle the life, these life cycles together. So one test class then typically, you know, wants to fire up a test environment and, and does so, and thus it runs, you know, much slower because then, you know, once you start the environment, um, it just begins to start something up. Or sometimes, but unfortunately not always, it checks whether something is already running and keeps it running, so then it will be faster. But then again, for me, it's actually harder or more cumbersome to configure and manage all these things here in this test class, rather than I would like to separate the life cycles. And for me, it's still easier to run you know, my environment, either you know, using Maven or using some shell scripts if you want, using plain Docker run, using Docker compose, you can do the same things if you have an external system or a mock server running locally or a data, database using Postgres using, um, running locally using Docker. That's actually easier to manage. And, you know, it's simple. You just run, you know, a shell script with Docker run three times or Docker compose if you want, or even a Kubernetes cluster locally if you want, right? But start it up first and separate it from the lifecycle of the test. Because once I am in the development flow, I just want to fire up my test and I want instant verification whether it works and not wait for even five seconds until that is up and running. So for me, that's 
um, the important thing here. Now, we have uh, some tests already. So another, um, you know, best practice, uh, have a proper test uh, uh, coverage for a code level tests, such as my unit test, have a proper coverage for end-to-end -end level tests. This might be included in the project or once it becomes more complex, you might have a dedicated system test project, maybe under the same uh, repository where you literally connect against, you know, a running application and fire them up some proper use case tests and proper acceptance tests where the application um, does the expected things. And this uh, test suite might already fire up a few more containers, a few more applications, depending um, what you do in this regard. All right. I can show you a little bit more of microprofile technology, if you like. So, for example, what we um, have, let's go back to this um, runtime thing. Again, all of that is included in these APIs that I just have. Microprofile, that's the umbrella one. So it includes, you know, um, health, config, a few other things. Uh, let's say I want microprofile metrics. That's another cool one um, as well. So this, you know, in my uh, from my experience, this really adds value to um, Jakarta when you say, okay, you don't have to implement, for example, microprofile metrics with the Prometheus uh, monitoring format yourself, but, you know, you can just um, do this automatically or not automatically, but using these, uh, using these APIs and you don't have to implement it yourself. So let's try this again. When I go to localhost uh, metrics, so slash metrics, that's the default metrics URI. Um, then, well, first of all, Liberty will tell me that needs to be accessed using you know, SSL because you actually need to authenticate and so on and so forth. Uh, but actually, I don't care in this uh, place, micro profile uh, metrics. Because typically it would like to, you know, see some user um, a name and password and so on and so forth. And now I say, oh, I don't care in this test example, just set the authentication to false. And again, I can reconfigure stuff here on the fly. And now what you see, this is the cryptical response of a Prometheus format. This is a, a plain te a text line based format of having, you know, some metrics like for default, some uh, runtime information such as uh, JVM information, memory, CPU, threading, garbage collection, and all kinds of stuff. What that already might be interesting for technical terms, if you want to um, monitor your application, or what is also interesting, if or more interesting, if you include some business metrics, right? So, for example, questions that the business care about. So, how many fees have been ordered? how much revenue we made by selling so and so many espressos and cappuccinos and whatnot. So that is a little bit more interesting to include APIs or include some metrics on a um, programmatic API level saying, oh, for example, we could have to inject some um, metrics here and then manually increase, you know, some counters. We have some gauges, histograms, um, and depending on what you want to do. Um, or there's another simple way, uh, for example, a um, declarative approach again of just counting actually method invocations so that's the probably easiest way saying okay this should be uh, coffees total so the total number of coffees for example and this is just a very basic counter um, that works here on this method and then well let me restart this again if for example i post some new let's do a latte why not um, to the system one two three three times and now i go back to my metrics Page, then I see another metric being included here. And this is now business related metric for total number of coffees, three. And then how that works is my application just emits that method. And then a Prometheus instance would scrape this method from this very page and then, you know, store it in this, in its time series database. And then you can have some fancy Grafana dashboards and things like that to display. Again, the nice story is if you use this combination of Jakarta and microprofile metrics, then you know it's very easy to implement. You don't have to um, write all of these formats yourself. You can just you know configure uh, the runtime to include it. Have some a um, little bit of code here. What you want to do programmatically, and you're done. That's uh, basically it. Now let's continue a little bit more on um, how to run our project in a more production-like setting. So what I want to show you more is on the deployment side. We already covered. Uh, Docker. So we have a Docker image of our uh, application here. 
what else you probably uh, have in your project is well some more sophisticated way to run um, containers so typically we have some kind of container orchestration nowadays for example you use kubernetes uh, similar things maybe docker compose what i want to show you is a kubernetes um, example so i have Cube control. I have um, a Kubernetes cluster that actually runs um, on the cloud. So uh, where you get Kubernetes clusters from? Well, there are many, many ways. Um, for example, you can install it um, locally. You can have mini cube or mini shift if you want. You can have a managed uh, Kubernetes service. This is typically what I use. So I use the IBM cloud uh, for managed Kubernetes. You can, uh, you can also have a managed OpenShift cluster if you want. And well, this runs um, actually here, not on my laptop, but on the cloud, but doesn't matter. And um, actually, let me do this again. Let me delete the resources again, just to show you the full uh, example, because now what I deploy is just this um, way of uh, deploying a service and you know, so-called deployment. So basically say, take this Docker image and deploy it, um, create what is called a pod, with one replica, so one part, one running instance, and you know, deploy it, make it accessible via load balancer, so-called service, this for this coffee shop application, and just deploy it. The nice story about this technology is you have what is called infrastructure as code. So same, you know, as a Docker file, that's also infrastructure as code. You define as code how the runtime is supposed to look like. So these are the steps for an individual running container or in this way, how the whole environment looks like, right? So how does your test environment, production environment look like? Well, exactly like this, you say, you want to fire up one instance of this running container, check the health here using this readiness probe and so on and so forth. Or if you want two, three, 10 replicas, that also works. You just change the declarative approach of specifying it here. And then the technology will make sure that this is the case. And of course, this is so much more productive than you know, calling support and ordering another server that needs to be installed physically and then installing, you know, Java, the runtime and so on and so forth, some configuration. So now in this world, we just run our containers and um, then this works here. So now this is empty, this cluster. Cube control get parts, there's no running application. So let's change this. We um, cube control apply everything that's in this folder so we apply our nice yaml files to basically create this so then it will just start up the application this coffee shop here we will uh, have a service being available what you just saw before and then it starts up this application we can access it so this looks good um, let's try this out once my application is up and running and ready to do some meaningful work again we use micro profile health check to check this then I can actually access it. So let's do this. Let's order some coffee um, on the cloud. I have a magic script that gets me the IP address of my public cluster. Then I say, for example, coffee shop, or let's check the health first, if you want. And now, okay, that's good. Now that is up and running. And I see, you know, version one, two, three, and so on and so forth. And I can even, well, order some coffee, right? So same URL again, I say orders. Now, please, we'll post some, let's do some latte again here to this uh, URL. And then nice, 201 created, this works. And now I can go back and check my coffee orders and there it is. So that's a nice story. I can order some coffee here. And well, another thing that I want to show you for the testing um, approach, um, what I talked uh, about before. So, I showed you this test with you know a very simple way to run it and now what i can do i can actually reuse either these tests or the components here to actually a test against the other environment so now i have my application running here in kubernetes so i say oh by the way why not just instead of localhost point this to my kubernetes cluster and run the same test and this is actually what you can do if you separate the test life cycle from the test environment life cycle because now my test is independent. It can just, you know, connect to any environment uh, that runs my application here and verify, you know, whatever I want to verify. So for example, verify whether it's up and running um, here. So in this regard, how I can run it, well, either in the IDE or here using Maven, I say, by the way, I have a system property, coffee shop um, test.host. Um, 
So I set this just to my um, um, cluster IP. And then I say, well, I also have coffee shop test.port. I say set this to 80. That's my uh, gateway here. And then I can just run this against now my Kubernetes cluster, uh, the application that runs there. And so that works. OK. Actually, never trust a test that is only being green. Let's say maybe that still runs the local uh, host version. Who knows? So let's misconfigure the port here. And then after a few seconds, we uh, hopefully run into a timeout because that is the wrong connection and says, OK, now this doesn't work. So it actually will test the application uh, that runs in my cluster. And that's why I can reuse these, uh, these tests. So that is another you know, nicer way to um, make your tests a little bit more effective. So I can um, reuse uh, the efforts that I put into these tests here and recycle them. Um, another important thing, what I always want to mention, if you look into uh, my material that I have for testing, um, you will see this as well. But I really care that for the tests you write, you implement at least some proper code quality, even if this is just test and just the test scope, but it will make your tests much, much more maintainable. So for example, in this test class, I only say, well, assert that coffee shop system is system up or get the application version equals to something else. How you get the application version is now implemented by a delegate by this test driver. It's even more obvious if you say, okay, how do I create a coffee order and how do I verify that the order is in the system? You don't want to leak some lower level HTTP or JSON detail here in this test class, because otherwise what happens if you have hundreds of test classes at the end or test methods, well, then if something changes, you're screwed. You have to throw away or uh, maintain a lot of, lot of test classes. What you can do here, you just change the lower abstraction, how it is implemented to, for example, get the application version and then just change the code here and you don't have to modify all of your test classes. So this is very, very important um, in general, just to keep your tests uh, more maintainable. So um, same is true for test data, just care about these abstraction layers in which, in which abstraction layer you're currently in and when it makes sense to implement something here. So that is um, basically it, how we can run our best practice uh, project now in, in a Kubernetes um, example. So for uh, Kubernetes or containerized applications, maybe you've heard of the 12 factor uh, principles um, that basically is applied or that is uh, sufficient if you run a uh, workload in this way by a um, containerized approach. You could reconfigure uh, things here and you can rebuild your application very, very quickly. So for example, assuming this approach is not enough for um, the dependencies that you have, stop now my my running workload here again you want to include for example you need to include another dependency i always highlight this because I, in my opinion this is sufficient for most of the projects um, here depending what you do sometimes you do have some other dependencies either on your runtime or in your code where you just need some more stuff so for example if your business use case is to do some image processing then of course it makes sense to include you know, the API, the dependency for this image processing. So this is a real use case requirement of some uh, dependencies that you add. But still what you should do in order to make your build stay productive, you should add them as a provided dependency to not you know, clutter up your deployment artifact. And then in your runtime, so for example, that is configured here in your Docker file, what you do, you add this dependency, this jar, for example, in a lower Docker image layer, because these, um, all of these lines, all of these commands result in individual Docker image layers. This is how um, Docker images work with the so-called uh, copy on write file system. And then what you do, um, for example, it's add, just as an example, a Postgres driver for a database. This will be a dependency that you don't even use in a POMXML, but only in the runtime then I don't want to include this into my WAR file because you know, that just adds a lot of uh, weight, a lot of balance. But I say, please add this in a lower level um, detail and a lower level um, image. And then you know, just have this um, included to the uh, libraries. Same is true for other jars if you want. And still you maintain these layers, right? So for example, um, you notice this one building. Uh, when I had my Docker uh, built before, you noticed I had this um, 
um, these uh, these layers. So now um, that is being um, updated as well. But still, if I change my application, for example, if, if I rebuild this using uh, Maven package, then only what it does, if I rebuild it here, um, not this, if I Docker rebuild this here, then it will not main, um, change the other layers. That's only cache and it will only actually um, execute the last step. It's even more interesting. So this is just the build time of saving maybe a few seconds. Um, it's much more uh, of an impact if we actually, well, push something over the wire. So for example, if we um, say do a Docker push of, let's rebuild this in another name, I call this Sebastian Dashner, so I can actually push it to a public uh, Docker repository. And if I say, okay, now I want to Docker push this, what it does, it analyzes the image and it sees, oh, actually only the last layer has been changed. So I literally just push whatever, you know, the last layer contains, which in my case is um, a tiny war file of, you know, a few kilobyte. And then it only pushes a few kilobyte. And regardless how the actual image, how big the image is, it doesn't push all of it. And I used, you know, I kid you not, I used mobile uh, tethering. I used um, airplane Wi-Fi before to push and pull Docker images. Because if you use this approach, it's literally just a few kilobytes that you transfer over the wire and you don't repush over and over again implementations that should be on a, on a different level. And I think this just makes a lot of uh, sense to consider. And it matches really well with the idea um, that was always implemented uh, by Enterprise Java of uh, having these thin deployment artifacts of putting the logic, your code, your use cases into um, your code into the deployment artifact that you ship and um, put the implementation into a different layer that typically is, you know, the runtime or application server, or however you want to call it. They implement how to do, you know, HTTP handling, how to do database transactions. And it also fits very well these abstractions that we now have in a containerized world of cloud native technology. For example, if you um, run it in Kubernetes, then, you know, this will implement how to do the service lookup, all the service load balancing, how to do the networking connection. If you have service meshes with Istio and other things, then um, you implement, you know, how to do mutual TLS, for example, or how to do um, the metrics scraping on a more uh, manageable scale, right? So you don't clutter up all of these details and you don't clutter your code with all of these details um, because your artifact, you know, does not need to include that. That's not a concern of the Java code you write. So keep the Java code clean uh, for the business logic. And I think this makes your project um, more maintainable and especially the builds um, more efficient. So as some key takeaways, um, what I care about that you use known technology and APIs, I think this is the most, um, or uh, one of the biggest advantages that you have with Jakarta that you also have with MicroProfile. You have APIs that are known um, to a lot of developers, you know, such as CDI, JAXRS, um, that is typically nothing new. And focus on what solves a, a business problem for you, right? So in um, the project that are, um, that are right, well, I want to focus on what I actually do, right? Uh, create coffee, so for example, right? Not um, um, implementing some other lower level technical details. Then I think the combination of uh, Jakarta and MicroProfile is awesome and is a very productive one to create modern um, applications, especially if you use MicroProfile. Um, the projects do basically fill the gaps that we still have in, um, in Jakarta that comes from Java EE, right? So for example, uh, injectable configuration, health checks, metrics, fault tolerance, and a few other things. Uh, I think that's just very productive. And this technology is also very interesting if you um, have projects with existing investment in EE, right? So if, especially the knowledge investment, if the developers know these APIs, CDI, JAXRS, it just makes sense to use um, a modern um, approach with modern runtimes. So for example, Open Liberty or Quarkus or Payara or, you know, all of these run modern runtimes that are really efficient and fast, then that's just a very efficient approach, I guess. Um, then keep the um, whole build and the whole tool usage simple and use the tools, you know, how they're good for what they're made for. Uh, so for example, Maven to build Java artifacts, Docker to build Docker images. In my eyes, this just makes sense and is the most efficient um, approach. 
and um, this is what what I use in projects, and this is um, what just works really well. I think and use and leverage these build tool conventions. So, for example, Maven conventions of uh, naming and and things like that. So you don't have to reconfigure um, or configure stuff. Uh, use the Docker um, best practices with the copy and write file systems. Same with the Kubernetes and these principles. And this just make it very very efficient. Um, and then very important to stay in this development workflow um, to, of the flow experience of developers to keep your turnaround time short. And I mean really short, as in you know, less than a second ideally or less than five seconds. Otherwise, you will get distracted and it's just way too annoying. And there are a lot of, lot of tools out there for all kinds of technologies actually to achieve that. You might use this Open Liberty development mode. Uh, Quarkus has a similar, uh, similar mode. Um, Spring DevTools, I never uh, used it myself, but uh, um, apparently can do the same thing of this hot reload um, approach. Um, take care how you craft your tests and your test scopes so that they execute really, really quickly, that you can just stay in a mode where you develop something locally, even if it involves you know, external systems or mocked systems, databases, and then just code something, change something and verify it. And also verify it on a test level. And this will make you very, very productive. And other than that, have some investment in you know, testing in general, automation, also as we saw, and some proper CICD approach. So regardless of this development workflow that you can build up, always also have a proper CICD pipeline that you know, builds a project, builds your images and uh, Docker images if you use that, and verifies that on a production-like environment from you know, beginning to end, regardless of what you do locally, that locally is just you know, an optimization to be more efficient, but then to verify that, that it works properly until you deploy to production as well. And I think if you use uh, these approaches, you will just be very efficient with modern enterprise Java. And from my experience, it's also a lot of fun to use these technologies. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for uh, watching and for listening. And if you're interested in um, a few of the materials that I pointed you to, you can have a look at this um, GitHub example and some other uh, materials there, some thoughts on testing um, in order to be a little bit more productive as an enterprise Java developer. Thank you. Okay, great, Sebastian. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's see if we have any questions in the chat. Please. Um, should the Jenkins or other CI/CD build Docker container from Docker file and deploy app on the uh, on it in time of a single task? Um, I see this question of if it's whether it's a single task or how you exactly implement it. I would say it depends. Uh, I've seen multiple approaches that, that um, mostly. Um, you know, depending on the on the actual environment that you have, so where Jenkins runs. So, for example, if Jenkins also runs in, um, in a Docker container, then you can actually build Docker containers inside of Docker containers. But then, typically, you use a, use another approach to build these images. So, for example, like scaffold or use some uh, some other technology or um, OpenShift builds to build the images. That is more like a you know detail, I would say, whatever makes sense for your environment. But in general, just have a proper um, sophisticated CI CD pipeline that builds this, um, ideally using the same approach that you could do uh, locally, but that's not a requirement. I hope this helps. Um, some yeah. other questions. Yes, server XML is open liberty specific. Okay, do we have some more questions? I don't see any more questions, but uh, yeah, if there are any questions uh, out there, now is the good time. Uh, everyone is impressed as always, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Um, so we're looking forward to um, another opportunity to have Sebastian back with the Jakarta Tech Talks. But uh, in the meanwhile, uh, let's wrap it up. And um, uh, again, uh, many thanks. And uh, we'll talk again in the new year. Already. Awesome. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye bye.